All right, so this is the second video in my regressions pitfalls series, uh, and I'm going to be talking about targeted learning and, and the procedure thereof. Uh, please check out the work by Vanden, uh, Vandalan and also Sherry. They've got a book out on targeted learning. Uh, they've sort of popularized it and done a lot of work with it. Um, but I will also be talking about uh, an example taken from a blog post on targeted learning, which I've linked to in the, in the slides. Uh, so what what is this all about? Well, if you haven't seen my first video, uh, then fair enough. Uh, I recommend that you, you watch that before, before going on to targeted learning, uh, because it will illustrate some of the pitfalls associated with undertaking a naive linear regression to try and estimate the relationships between variables. So the problem formulation might be as follows. We might have access to some data for uh, all of these variables, uh, but more specifically for whether or not an individual is assigned a treatment. A it could be 0 or 1, or it could be a continuous variable. And then whether or not they improve, either, again, uh, they'll fully recover, 0 or 1, uh, or they will have some kind of continuous metric associated to their recovery, um, Y. Uh, and then we also have access to these control variables, also called covariates. Uh, and these are other uh, variables that we're interested in uh, that relate uh, either directly to our outcome or to our assignment of treatment. And so in reality, we, we don't have access in, uh, to our true causal model when we're collecting observational data. And even in randomized control studies, there are relationships between these variables, which means that the people get a, that get assigned treatment uh, do not represent a, the same or identical distribution as those that do not get assigned treatment. Uh, so it's very important that we sort of uh, adjust for these relationships between our covariates, uh, whether or not someone gets a treatment and whether or not they improve. So one example can, uh, causal diagram might look as follows, and you can see that it, it could vary hugely in terms of complexity, uh, but here we have arrows uh, going from, say, these, these covariates, say W2, uh, through W3 to A with sort of mediation effect, uh, also a mediation effect through W3 to Y, and then also a direct effect from W2 to Y. So, And that's just taking one of these variables uh, here. There's plenty of paths and, and complication there. So if we don't have access to this uh, and we can't undertake our uh, sort of favorite uh, do calculus pipeline, how do we estimate what we're really interested in, which is this treatment effect that's highlighted in red here? And I'll just reiterate, please uh, check out this uh, blog post here, which, which goes through it with uh, examples in R. So the next slide is pretty dense, uh, and I wanted to get everything all on one slide and just talk it, uh, talk through each of these 10 steps in turn. So we start at step one, and we've, we've, we have some data. Uh, we've got data for an outcome, why. We've got data for whether or not an individual receives treatment. And I'm going to assume these are both uh, binary for now, just for simplicity. And then we also have access to these covariates, W, which could include demographics um, or, or whatever you want, you know, previous health uh, issues and so on. Uh, now, if we want to simulate the data and sort of investigate targeted learning, then I've got these steps two and three here. Um, so if you want to generate your own data, please uh, please uh, feel feel welcome to do so. And uh, if so, you'll also want to calculate uh, and generate these counterfactuals for setting A equals to one and A equals to zero. Uh, and from this, you can actually derive a ground truth psi. So I'm going to call the treatment effect from A to Y, which is this red line here. I'm going to call this effect psi and we have access to the true psi if we're generating our own synthetic data uh, which which again is feel free to do so and you can sort of compare uh, how biased or how accurate these various different methods are like uh, the naive method which most people use and then this targeted learning method see how close they are to the true estimate of that uh, causal effect so again if we are syn uh, synthesizing our own data we can get step three here we have our true psi um, and then we might go on to step four and take the naive approach, which again is the most common approach in the literature and uh, is uh, arguably one of the reasons why uh, science is struggling, uh, is certainly in observational science, to sort of uh, reproduce and, and replicate uh, results. So that method that most people adopt is just to simply chuck all of these, uh, all of this information into a, into a regression model. Uh, we've got y, which is the outcome, we've got uh, some intercept, uh, and then we've got this the, the parameter we're interested in estimating psi multiplied by our treatment A, uh, and then we've got a big matrix of covariates W and uh, corresponding um, parameters uh, beta. Uh, and so if we do this regression, we get our estimate for psi, uh, and that will give us naive psi here. And if we had also simulated some data in steps two and three, then we can actually calculate the amount of bias between our true psi and then the naive estimate that we have for it. So this is quite similar to what we did in the in the previous video that I made where we were able to sort of compare uh, 
um, what estimates for the coefficients you get if you just chuck everything in the model naively uh, versus uh, having a consideration for the underlying causal model. And this video is sort of a natural continuation to that because we're assuming we don't actually have access to that true model uh, very often. So then step six comes along, and this is the sort of first introduction for, for the steps for undertaking this targeted learning. Uh, is we want to get an estimate for the expectation of whether or not someone improves given both uh, their assignment of treatment and their covariates. Uh, and this is sort of part of this G computation step in causal inference. And we're going to train a classifier, and uh, van der Laan, uh, like to use uh, et al. like to use this super learner, which is an ensemble or a big library of uh, the best machine learning algorithms. They even sort of propose their own, which is um, a highly adaptive lasso um, classifier or regressor. Uh, and we're going to call this either single classifier, uh, M, and if, in the very simplest case, which is not ideal because it doesn't give us that many advantages, uh, we'll just use a logistic regressor, uh, in which case we'll sort of include in the model and intercept our uh, assignment of treatment and these covariates W. So again, we, we haven't really done anything particularly interesting yet, but once we've trained this model, we can generate uh, this Q1W and Q0W. So these are the estimates for whether or not an individual gets better or not, having set or intervened on the A variable, setting A equals 1 for all of the individuals in the sample. Uh, this would, you know, If we were using a super learner, this would be on that holdout validation set. Uh, if you're just using a simple log logistic regression, you could actually undertake this on the uh, data that you started with. Uh, and um, we do the same for uh, A equals 0, so we set all of the individual's um, assignment of treatment to zero, and then we predict whether or not they get better. So again, this is a little bit like doing an intervention and seeing, uh, giving a prediction for whether or not the, in the individual would have gotten better, re regardless of whether or not their original assignment of treatment was yes or no. Uh, and then uh, we can actually compute, uh, these are just some various steps to get it back into lo logits or probabilities, uh, we can then comp compute the sort of first or Q0 estimate of uh, TMLE, which is the difference between the probabilities of them getting better or not, uh, given that they either get treatment or not. And so that gives us our first estimate. Now the trouble with this is that it doesn't really account for, again, all the bias that might be associated between uh, the assignment of treatment and the covariates that exist for an individual. So what we really want to do at that point is, is move on to step seven, which is to find the propensity scores, which we're going to call G, uh, which is the you know the relationship between the assignment of treatment and the covariates. So someone's called the exposure mechanism. Uh, the bottom line is who gets treatment, how likely is it that someone gets treatment or not uh, based on their covariates, so the demographics, etc. So then we're going to again train another classifier, and this can be another super learner, uh, to predict whether or not someone is assigned treatment, A equals 1, given their covariates. Uh, and, uh, and in order to do so, we, we can take a very similar uh, procedure as above. If we're using a super learner, we might use cross-validation uh, to, to acquire that probability. So then using these propensity scores, we can uh, find what's known as the stabilized inverse probability of treatment weights, IPTWs, and this is a way of accounting for the probability of, of, of receiving treatment or not for any individual. I've uh, someone seen this referred to as clever covariates, um, H0 and H1, uh, and from these we can derive what are known as fluctuation parameters, which are, are really just, it's all related, it's just a way of compensating uh, for the relationship between the assignment of treatment and the covariates. So the procedure is as follows, uh, we, we use the original, in order to do this, we use the original computation for QAW, which was the uh, before we intervened, the, the prediction using our super learner. Uh, we're also going to use the propensity scores that we've just calculated, uh, and we're going to uh, first calculate these H0 and H1, uh, which I, I here I've used to denote the uh, identity function, so it's 1 whenever A equals 0. In this case here, it's 1 whenever A equals 1 uh, and 0 otherwise. And uh, on the bottom, we've got here 1 minus G1W, which will be 1 minus the probability of uh, receiving treatment, i.e. the propensity score, which is essentially the probability of them not receiving treatment. So you can either put 1 minus G1W here or you can write G0W uh, and then the inverse of that for H1. So we've sort of got two of these, one for when they do, don't get treatment, H0, and one when they do get treatment, H1, and there's sort of this inverse uh, propensity score uh, normalizing this, uh, uh, this identity function on the top. Uh, and so then we can chuck it all into a uh, linear model uh, and 
acquire the coefficient epsilon uh, for this term here. Now this term here is just the difference between h1 and h0. Uh, you can uh, you know, feel free to look at this term here. You can um, uh, verify that. And we're also going to offset it here by our initial uh, estimates for whether or not someone improves. So once we've got this epsilon parameter, this is the thing that we need, the fluctuation parameters, uh, this is the thing that we need to compensate for the, the fact that the covariates relate to whether or not an individual received treatment. So you can update now uh, the original estimates from our super learner here, uh, Q1W and Q0W, given whether or not they received treatment or didn't. Uh, using these epsilon, this epsilon parameter. So to, to do that, you'll, you'll uh, acquire what's known as Q star, which is the uh, sort of TMLE estimate for whether or not someone improves given uh, treatment and no treatment. Uh, and that is log it of Q uh, in individually for Q1, uh, Q0 here, epsilon times H, where you'll have H0 and H1. So you have sort of two versions based on whether or not you're looking at whether they did get treatment or not. And then finally, you can calculate psi TMLE as the mean of this Q star, given A equals 1 and the covariates, minus Q star A equals 0 and the covariates. And this will give you uh, a robust estimate. And there's, there's lots of sort of guarantees here, theoretical guarantees that you can, you can look up in the literature uh, to show that this is a much more reliable estimate of uh, the causal effect between your treatment and your outcome, given all these covariates and accounting for the relationships between uh, all these covariates. So uh, from, from what I've uh, learned about this, uh, this, this method, uh, it seems to be the best way of, of sort of robustly estimating a causal effect in, in light of the fact that we very, very rarely have access to the true underlying causal structure uh, for our data. Uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, that you look into it and, uh, and uh, that this video has been useful.